The modern transmission of knowledge dates back to the foundation of what is considered to be the oldest university in the world, the University of Bologna. Actually, this university was the first to use the Latin word universitas, meaning community, to describe a group of teachers and scholars. This foundation occurred in 1088, which, to put everything in context, was the year following the death of William I of England, who, as the Duke of Normandy, had conquered England a little more than 20 years earlier. Fast forward two centuries and a half. This is a lecture at the University of Bologna around 1350. The word lecture means in French reading, and actually, in the Commonwealth, professors are often still called readers. Transmission of knowledge was basically a professor reading from a book and students taking notes. It made a lot of sense, as we shouldn't forget that this was one century before the printing press appeared in Europe, and books looked like this. If you think that textbooks are expensive, painfully copied books were by far more precious. Note-taking was the economical way of spreading information. Additionally, taking notes was helpful for memorizing. A famous Latin phrase says, quis scribit bis legit, writing is like reading twice. Very interestingly, we see in the audience different behaviors. Attentive students, either taking notes or perhaps trying to memorize knowledge, and students, obviously more interested by their neighbors, or trying to catch up on a prior night probably spent in meditation and prayer, as is common with students. Fast forward another six and a half centuries, and here we have not a university lecture, but something very similar, a technical conference. We retrieve the same patterns as 650 years ago. Some people are attentive, although some are giving signs of nearing the breaking point. Some are taking notes, a behavior far more common with students and some are past the breaking point, including one catching up on a prior night devoted to meditation and prayer. Obviously, it was tough. What do these people and students want? They don't want a lot of information. They can read. They can search the web. I believe they want two things. Firstly, pointers. By pointers, I don't mean a bunch of hyperlinks. These may be appreciated in a document, but not in a presentation. A pointer is mostly what I need to search for. Secondly, understanding. If technical docs were perfect, there won't be any professional computer books. People need an understanding of how things work and why sometimes they don't. This isn't best achieved by showing five bullet point slide after five bullet point slide. Talking of slides, we may question when obviously our lives have changed so much in 650 years. What was the impact of technological progress on the transmission of knowledge that is at the origin of this progress? The good news is that technology has in recent years had a massive impact, especially on the audience side. With your smartphone, you can play when you have given up, you can chat with somebody who doesn't need to be sat next to you, and thanks to social networks, you can let the whole world know how boring the lecture is. Progress has been less impressive on the lecturer side. The first massive improvement appeared towards the turn of the 20th century with a blackboard. The blackboard allowed showing and explaining abstract topics far better than reading from books or notes. Additionally, writing was pressing the talk and was allowing students, still taking notes, to keep their rhythm. Talk and choke became massively popular and serious in academic circles. There are a few downsides. One is that even if lecturers prepare the lecture, the bulk of the work takes place during the lecture. Another one is that a good part of the lecture is spent with your back turned towards students. It's not the best way to engage with them or to control a restless audience. Finally, there is a limit to how big you can write. In a huge lecture hall, if the first rows can follow, people at the back often guess more than they can read and usually give up pretty quickly.
Most of the downsides of the blackboard disappeared in the 1950s-1960s with the spread of the overhead projector. You could address a very large audience and still remain legible. You could prepare everything in advance and keep eye contact with your audience most of the time. You could have proper figures photocopied from books and you had other individual sheets or, in some cases, full scrolls that you were advancing as you were progressing in your talk. Some presenters couldn't resist the temptation of writing overwhelming information. You could still introduce a bit of interactivity by writing on your transparencies with a dry marker during your talk. Of the head transparencies inaugurated a new era of lecturers reading and sometimes paraphrasing their visual material, a practice universally hated by audiences. Additionally, with other red transparencies, whatever you write stays visible for a much shorter time than when written on a large blackboard. It makes more difficult to have some backward references to topics seen earlier. In the late 1980s appeared Slideware and its most famous representative, PowerPoint. Initially designed to generate transparencies, it was allowing everybody to have a professional-looking presentation and soon became ubiquitous. Textbook publishers, for instance, hurried to supply instructors with textbook slides. Some instructors, of course, tried to make their slides a bit less dull than standard fare. They tried to change the background, to use what they were viewing as a friendly font, to use fancy animations to try to keep some interest to your ring lectures. Even some degree of suspense. Will the E end up being parallel to BC? The result often looked in the best of cases gimmicky, and in the worst of cases, corny, to the point that in the academic world many instructors have returned to the blackboard, which unfortunately isn't an option in the professional world. The curse of PowerPoint is probably that most people are thinking slides, designing slides and animating individual slides with animations that are far too often embellishments that are more disruptive than useful. It doesn't need to be so. Let's return to our blackboard theorem. We can with slideware have something far neater than blackboard scribbling, and we can prepare it in advance. But we can also organize slides in a way that matches how we would support a talk using chalk and a blackboard. We can use animations, but it's probably much easier to start from the final slide and work backwards, copying it and removing a bit and repeating the process as many times as we need to pause and comment when presenting. What we obtain then is a sequence of slides, and we can make the sequence extremely fluid by using almost invisible transitions such as fade or wipe. In fact, the less visible the transitions, the better. Slides are not here to woe the audience, they are here to support your talk. The idea of sequence goes much farther than decomposing a slide into successive elements. A big advantage of slideware of a blackboard is that you can easily introduce nice and sometimes complex diagrams. For instance, a famous story about the intercept theorem is how the Greek mathematician Thales used it to compute the height of Egyptian pyramids around 600 BC by comparing the shadow of a stick to the shadow of a pyramid. If you project the diagram as a separate slide, there is a break in your talk. Additionally, don't forget that we might on a blackboard still have the formulas in one corner. Perhaps we want to keep them on slides as well. I have recreated, with simple shapes, a similar diagram to illustrate my story. As I don't want to confuse students with the fact that as the sun is very far away, all rays can be considered parallel, I've kept a single ray. One thing that is very important, though, is that, although this slide is significantly different from the previous one, 
I maintain a degree of continuity not only with the text of the theorem that is still there, but also visually by placing the top of the pyramid where the top of the triangle was, even if the triangle I look at isn't the pyramid. Then a bit of animation will help to relate the diagram to the theorem. But it's not enough. I want to rekindle the interest of my audience, and the diagram, even if it looks semi-realistic, may not be enough for that. As a drum roll before the example, I introduce one intermediate slide with a picture, which will be my background for introducing Thales. Once again, continuity not only by keeping the theorem on every slide, but by keeping the top of one of the pyramids at the same place just like a guiding star. Here is how it goes. In the end, I can point out that the distance between the stick and the pyramid doesn't matter, that the length of the stick shadow depends on the time of the day, not its placement, and that it doesn't need to be in the shadow of the pyramid. One of the problems with PowerPoint is that most of the advice you read about it is targeted at what is generally called TED type presentation, which are rarely heavily technical. On the Microsoft side, you read advice such as minimize the number of slides. I hope to have convinced you that it's a bad advice. Use the number of slides that you are comfortable with to tell your story. You can animate slides and have fewer of them, or you can animate them less and have more of them. The problem isn't in the number of different slides, but in the number of jumps that make the experience jarring for the audience. If you have a smooth sequence, the number of slides doesn't matter. The other advices are better, but can be misused. One is to use pictures. In a technical talk, it's probably a good idea to show pictures of the people you talk about, because as human beings, we react positively to the representation of other human beings. It's also a good idea to use simple shapes to draw diagrams, in the same way we would draw figures on blackboard. Another advice is to use few words, this can be more of a problem in a technical environment. If you want to show a program or a database query, it may be a significant amount of text. Perhaps, though, that we shouldn't consider code as text and only restrict ourselves for whatever we add as comment to the code. The few words pictures approach has a downside. Few words picture looks terribly like the intertitles of silent movies and it can become quickly very repetitive. Additionally, how do you want to explain a complex process? The key is probably simply to stop thinking about slides, but once again about sequences. And I'd like to show you an example with a non-technical topic presenting some of the most famous comedians when cinema was still young. Here is a type of slide you see too often, with a few introductory lines taken from the Wikipedia page for Inshector, followed by another similar slide. It looks like the kind of competent but not very attractive and not memorable presentation that you often see in the technical world. This is easy to improve by applying the advice Use Pictures. Pictures make for a friendlier and more memorable presentation but showing everything at once is a mistake because while I'll be talking about Max Linder, you'll be probably reading about Chaplin or Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, who are far more famous today. I can improve my show by displaying information actor by actor, as I talk, in a blackboard way, and I can even dim what I have already talked about to keep the attention of the audience focused on my current topic. It can be animated blocks on one slide or several successive slides, it doesn't matter. However, there are two very distinct slides when I really have a single topic. 
This is a problem you often have in a computer science or information technology presentation when you want to explain a program that does a little more than displaying Hello World on the screen and cannot fit on one slide and remain legible. If you have no header and no footer, which are dispensable, the break between the two slides can be very easily remedied by changing the layout of the second slide and by using a push transition between the two slides. It gives a feeling of scrolling down and keeps the continuity. There is just one problem, which is that I'm losing quickly what was on the previous slide. It's not much of an issue here, but it might be with the program. Keeping some context might help improve continuity. Another, slightly more complicated but more attractive way of maintaining continuity is to carry a chunk of the previous slide to the current slide, like this. At this point, we need an aside. In most cases, you have the choice for making elements appear or disappear from a slide between animation on a single slide or successive slides with a transition such as cut, fade or wipe. There are, however, two types of visual changes that cannot be performed with a transition and require animation, moving an element from a place to another and changing its size to make it bigger or smaller. These changes are actually important, because they allow keeping in the visual scope information that you know you will need later, but that you must put aside so as to give remnants to other information. So, how did I keep Laurel and Hardy from one slide to the other? On the first slide, I decided about what I should keep and what should go away. I prepared the second slide. Then, I selected what I wanted to keep, pasted it on the second slide, and added a vertical translation, taking it from the slide 1 position to the slide 2 position. Then, I did an intermediate slide, removed my block from the second slide, and copied it to the new slide. I actually copied it twice to also have a shell with exactly the same move, and I copied into this shell what I want to see disappear. And so I have a chunk that moves to its place on the second slide, and another one that moves out at the same speed. I just have to add a fade out to the top block that lasts as long as the move, start all moves at the same time, and make the intermediate slide immediately switch to the last slide to see the desired effect. These transient slides are extremely important to maintain visual continuity. I'm using a lot of them in this presentation, and here is a great example. I mentioned the fact that on the blackboard, elements can remain for a long time. In fact, even if I'm talking about one comedian at a time, two in the case of Laurel and Hardy, I want to keep most of them in the visual field because they have relationships. Chaplin was a great admirer of Landair, and it's reported that when he learned about Landair's death by suicide, he closed his studio for one day out of respect. The character of the Trump first appeared in a film of Mabel Normand. She was also the one who convinced the famous director Maxinet to give a second chance to Chaplin after an unconvincing first film. Chaplin gave a small role to Keaton, then half forgotten, in Limelight. Harold Lloyd was THE big comedian of the late twenties, with Keaton and Chaplin. When they were young, the British Stan Laurel was the understudy of Chaplin in the vaudeville company with which they first toured the US. Keaton was at the funerals of Laurel and was often heard saying that him, Keaton, wasn't the funniest, that Chaplin wasn't the funniest, but that the funniest guy was Laurel. I could present people one by one, fitting slides, so has to keep everybody I've seen so far. But the change of scale of the pictures makes the experience unpleasant and the audience will still see slide, slide, slide. So I'm using the technique of intermediate slides to shrink and move pictures to their final place. Honesty forces to say that positioning everything properly requires a good deal of practice. 
But error is what it gives, and here you can tell whatever you want about each comedian, at your rhythm, posing whenever you want, in a flow where slides have simply vanished to make place for your presentation. The conclusion is that you don't need to have static slides, and with simple techniques you can have something that is much more like a film and supports your presentation instead of being a straitjacket. Oh, and by the way, all you have seen were PowerPoint slides, about 145 of them. <laughs>